proximity is not the same as, ac as uh, access. VR outreach for museums. Uh, and this is a presentation by Kay, Kay Fraser, and she's from San Francisco, and she's a content creator, digital strategist, licensed teacher, and she's passionate about closing the digital divide in, in education. Uh, and because of the time zone difference, uh, this presentation is pre-recorded a few days ago. So we will show a, a video with this presentation. Hi everyone. What if you could put on a VR headset and instantly transport into a museum? Even though VR has been on the scene for years, many museums are still hesitant to engage with the new medium. However, for museum visitors, 360 video, AR, and VR have the potential to provide museums with the access that many of us have always dreamed about, but we were denied. To get started, my name is Kai Frazier, and I am an educator, a museum professional, and now an entrepreneur making galleries, libraries, archives, monuments, and museums accessible by using virtual reality in the metaverse. For a bit of context, I've worked as a history teacher for most of my career. Inside my classroom, I was often frustrated because my school struggled to provide field trips to nearby museums due to budget constraints. And also, we barely had any tech for our students. We had very outdated tech that was hard to get our hands on. So when you grow up like myself and the students I've taught, there really isn't a lot of money for vacations. So school field trips are usually our only opportunity to explore the world outside of our neighborhoods. However, in the US, since 2010, 50% of schools no longer take field trips, and that's mostly because their schools can't afford them. With COVID-19, nobody took field trips to museums worldwide. This is unfortunate because one of my favorite stats is when kids go on field trips, they're actually 95% more likely to graduate from high school. And that's because when kids go on field trips, they see new inspiring ideas, sounds, locations, careers, cultures, and that dramatically changes their outlook on life. After I left my classroom, I decided that I wanted to go from teaching history to working directly with history. And I went on to work for some of the biggest history museums in Washington, DC. And I found this great new career working with eyewitnesses to history, and I produced their stories so kids could learn from them. While working in these museums, I couldn't help but notice very few people that visit the museums and work in museums look like me. When I would talk to my students who were just 30 minutes down the street, I would ask them, why don't they come to visit museums? One, their schools couldn't afford the field trips. And second, even though these museums were free, the schools couldn't afford the field trips because they still had to pay for the buses to get kids there, the school lunches. It was hard to get permission slips signed. And if a kid had a behavior issue, they weren't allowed to go on the field trip. So overall, kids just didn't get to go. So I learned the hard way that even though the museums were about 20 or 30 minutes away from our schools, proximity does not equal access. Without a deliberate effort to make these museums accessible to kids, the students just didn't go. And when it came to museums, museum careers, I saw firsthand why there was a lack of diverse museum professionals inside these museums. And that's because a student can't aspire to something if they don't know it exists. So when you're taking field trips to museum, you may think working in a museum is a great career, but if you never visit a museum, that career never makes it in your mind. So how could a student consider working at a museum if they weren't even given that opportunity? And then I realized that that content I produced was a really good way to get that back to students. And for some of my students, that content, the videos I made, was their only exposure to the museums. 
So I took all of these life experiences and I tried to brainstorm a way to give students access to the world around them, including museums. I wanted them to be able to go in and learn from museums, even if they couldn't go on a traditional field trip. So I began to look a little bit deeper into virtual reality to see if this could be a way to help close opportunity gaps. Using VR, I could bring those museum stories I made directly to my students. And that's how I began to use VR to make museums accessible beyond the four walls of a museum. In this picture, I went and I went to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, DC, and I filmed that in VR and I brought it back to my students in the classroom. So this is how we were, this is how we were bringing museums, monuments, and more back to students. So I always like to pause here and I never assume people know what I'm talking about when I say VR. So I wanna go over the basics. So to get started, what is VR? Simply put, VR is when you use a device such as a VR headset to be fully immersed in a new environment. So that means you may put a headset on, uh, a VR headset using the device that you use, and as soon as that headset goes on over your eyes, new worlds are open and you are transported wherever you would like to go, including museums. While wearing a headset, you may see new experiences and sounds and cultures, and most times it really feels like you're in that new world, even if you're just sitting on a couch. At KayakZar, we specialize in VR for kids. We make lots of safe, kid-friendly uh, VR so kids can see a variety of things, ranging from uh, the Obama portraits to the Sistine Chapel. I also, there's been a lot of talk about the metaverse. So I wanna talk about that for a second. We're talking about why we're making this VR. So on the bright side, there's really no widely accepted definition of what the metaverse is, but a lot of people think the metaverse will be the fancier high-tech successor to the internet. But if I had to try to define it, I would say it is a virtual space where you can explore, dream and create by yourself or with others in this virtual space that's very different than your physical space. So a lot of times you bring in elements like AR, VR, XR, 360, all that comes together as we're creating these virtual spaces where we're able to um, explore with by ourselves or other folks. Like I said, my company actually specializes in VR um, and helping kids get into this new metaverse. Um, I created my company after working in museums and being really frustrated that even though my students live nearby to museums, there were a lot of budget constraints or they just didn't feel welcome in the museums. So I wanted to, I wanted my students to explore museums in an environment that felt accessible to them. We like to say that we give kids a front row seat to museums and monuments with these VR field trips. But here's the point I really want to stress for museums and that's accessibility. I specifically designed my company around accessibility, and that means if you don't have a fancy or an expensive VR headset, you can still explore our virtual field trips to museums on any device. That means if you have a smartphone, uh, you can view it on a smartphone. If you have a tablet, you can view it on a tablet. And what that looks like is if this is my smartphone, I would hold my phone up above me, below me, and everywhere I move my phone, I'm going to see part of that 360 picture. Um, Matter of fact, I think I can change my screen and you can see kind of on a phone or a tablet, you can still see it, it still moves around, um, but you're just not fully immersed in the headset. This is important because how you design VR um, is how people can uh, access it. So if I design VR for an Oculus Quest headset, that means I can only view it in that one Oculus Quest uh, headset. So that means not an Oculus Go, not an HTC Vive, not a Pico headset, all these different headsets on the market. If it's coded for that one VR headset, that's all it can be used for. So to code for different headsets um, and different devices, it costs a little bit more money. Um, but by making my company a web accessible, um, we're a web-based platform, you can be on anything. So although creating VR is fantastic, 
I always remind institutions to think about accessibility as a priority and how kids are going to connect to it or how your audience will connect to it. And that should be a decision that happens in the ideation process so you know how you're going to build and capture that experience. If not, you're going to get to the very end and then realize you may not be able to use it the way you think. So can't stress enough who is going to be who is going to access the experience you create. Once again, KayakStar, we do immersive and non-immersive. These are some examples of how you can use VR in a non-immersive way. There are lots of ways to create VR, but I think the easiest way to get started if your museum wants to do a prototype or something like that is a 360 filming. This was my first prototype I made using a Samsung Gear, this camera that I have right here. And I simply mounted that Samsung Gear camera onto a tripod and then did a time lapse. And I let it film in front of the MLK or the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Um, and because I did this, I then, uh, because I filmed it in 360, I was able to upload it to YouTube very easily. And that means kids were, can view it on a cardboard headset as well. Um, so they can view it on a smartphone, they can view it on a headset, but I tell everybody, this is a really easy way to get started. Film it in a 360 camera, and then you can upload it to Facebook, you can upload it to YouTube. You can do a lot of things with it as you're testing out your prototype. With the time lapse I created, I was able to make that accessible. I mean, excuse me, I was able to make that monument accessible to my students. So this is me using some $20 headsets with my students, uh, put the VR experience on them, and they were able to stand right in front of and see what I was seeing when I was filming. Once again, this camera is pretty low cost, um, under $100, and this was able for me to get a strong prototype out to start to have the idea to build in VR. We did the same thing for our VR experience at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery when we created a virtual field trip to visit the Obama portraits. So we upped our camera up, had a production crew come out, and they were able to film. So you're seeing um, on this shot, this black thing is a VR camera. Um, and uh, this filming, we put the camera directly in front of what we want to film, which is these portraits, put a storyline around it, and we were able to film this and put it on YouTube. And then the young lady next to me, she's testing to see what it looks like. So she's actually able to view the Michelle Obama portrait that you'll see in this GIF um, up close and personal, and that made her day. So once again, we're making this accessible to all kids all over simply by deciding and thinking first how the VR will be used. YouTube is a great resource to get started with the ins and outs of you, uh, VR, and I can't stress it enough. So on this site, I went to YouTube VR, I Google YouTube VR, and I came up with this page, and it literally tells you best practices, how to shoot and direct your shots, and what to do in post-production, we call that stitching. So if you have to stitch up any of your shots, this shows you how to. So just getting started, buy your first 360 camera, want to do some prototype testing in the museum, this is a great way to go. Museums are becoming, uh, VR and museums are becoming more and more popular, especially during a pandemic. So when I just went into YouTube and searched Museums 360, you're gonna see different examples of museums who have done just what I told you. They found a camera, did a small prototype, uh, maybe uh, enhanced it with a camera or some, a storyline, but that 360 filming is how they're able to bring their work alive using YouTube for this example. So here, this is one of the productions that I see at the Met, uh, and you can uh, view this as well. So keeping on to VR exhibitions, one of the things that we're going to see is some museums make full new exhibitions in VR. And there's a really great one at the Louvre in Paris. Um, so if you know, if you've ever been to Louvre and you've seen the Mona Lisa, you will know that enormous crowds form around it. But now with this VR experience, the Louvre was able to make a, a virtual exhibition, which is called Mona Lisa Beyond the Glass. And I want to play about five minutes of it you can see exactly how they put it together and how this came to life. Mona Lisa behind the glass offers visitors to go inside the painting, not only to look at it from outside, but to try to be within the universe of the painting. completely new, 
It's the first time that we are using virtual reality for an experience for the visitors within the room. It is the most visited museum in the world. We are welcoming roughly 10 million of visitors, which is of course a lot. Everybody wants to see the painting, but because of the crowd, you have the average of 30 seconds standing in front of the paintings because there are too many people. It's very important that we are able to address both people, people who are coming here and people who are not coming here, but who are interested in the Louvre. They said, we need to find a way to get closer to the painting and what Da Vinci wanted to express. And the VR experience seems to be the best way to do it. We were really happy to work with HTC and MEC to create this meeting between our curators, experts of Leonardo and VR experts. It took us a gigantic amount of work to separate the myth from the truth and we discovered the techniques that were used. We wanted to explain the story behind that painting. The composition and the way Da Vinci did it was a revolution at this because he created a new way of painting people. Mona Lisa is both a masterwork, but it's also an image that is very easy to understand. She's a woman, but still she's not a movie star and she's behaving very properly, so it's quite easy to get along with her. Bring Mona Lisa to life was a real challenge because we only know her face. Should we represent her as a painting? Should we represent her as the living woman? We had the chance to go to the Louvre and be alone with Mona Lisa. And we can really focus our attention on every detail. But we can't really see every detail because you have an old varnish, the glass in front of her, with all the deep scientific analysis they gave us. We have infrared, we have X-ray, we have special reflectography. One of the most challenging part was to model the face because her expression is extremely subtle. We worked with a 3D model specialist. We did a thousand back and forth to find a good expression. We had to decide exactly how she was dressed. We used all the scientific elements with light, X-ray, and we established a map with the different pieces, clothes, just to ensure it responds accurately when she moves. to try to recreate the environment around her. We tried to understand what kind of place she was in. The landscape that Da Vinci did behind Mona Lisa is not a realistic one. It's part of the magic relationship between the, what the background says. And we had to remove Mona Lisa, recreate the background, try to expand and to guess how it would look like. In the home version, you'll be able to find more information, more content about Mona Lisa and other artworks as well. We have recreated the Grand Gallery, it's the main gallery from the Louvre, and you will see four paintings of Leonardo, and you will have some details about the different paintings. I think innovation and digital innovation is great for museums, and we have to use it as a tool to discover again art and masterpieces. Nevertheless, we have to be careful not to use too many screens between the art and our audiences. The overall experience will enable the visitors to open their eye to the Joconda and to Mona Lisa, and maybe to open their mind also. It's quite difficult to look at the most famous painting of the world. What I am seeing when I'm looking at Mona Lisa and the VR will help visitors to understand what is behind the curtain. So that's the perfect ending. I'm going to end it right there. Um, so as we get over in closing, there's some other resources you can do too. So the Mona Lisa one that we were just talking about, I want to stress that's a more expensive production. Um, and that is a, they recreated that to work on the HTC Vive. So that one headset and this side is going to be viewed in person. And they also have a home viewing one of you would like as well. So they decide how audiences are going to use it. Uh, and then what tech are you going to use? So HTC Vive is a little bit more expensive of a headset, but it's still a headset that works. So something to think about. Next thing you can see is Google Arts and Culture. You can just type this into YouTube and you're going to see lots of um, artifacts and museum pieces like this is inside the Discovery, uh, the Discovery spaceship. This is perfect. You can watch this in VR and well. And this is with a 360 camera. The other thing I talked about is uh, Facebook 
owns Oculus. Oculus is a big deal for a lot of VR folks. Um, so you can see several museums by just going to the Oculus store. Um, and this is a web browser of inside the headset and you can put in museums. And here's an example of what I came up with. So I can view this whole museum from that headset. Another museum, this one costs a little bit of money, but same thing, you can view museums within a VR headset. So this is the thing that you wanna do, this is an option as well. Another example that uh, my company did is we went to Kansas City, Missouri to film the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Uh, and this is a museum that talks about the history of the um, Blacks that wanted to pay baseball in the early 1900s, late 1800s, but they were discriminated against. So we came to go through the history of the leagues um, and bring this museum all over using 360 filmings. So you have lots of different options to pull VR off. Um, none of them are wrong, but you will have to keep trying and see what happens. So in closing, I want you to think about this as you're creating your new VR. Um, does a museum have to be four walls? For many folks who have never seen themselves represented in the museums, many are now creating virtual museums using VR. And in a virtual world, you get to curate the museum, which often leads to increased visibility and representation, especially for marginalized communities. I want to encourage everybody to check out AR, VR, and XR examples in museums, as well as other fields as well, um, because there's so many people that we have to learn from in this emerging field. So as a museum community, we all have a great opportunity to decide the future of museums and i'm really looking forward to seeing what we create so i'm going to pause right there if i can ever answer any questions please you can feel free to contact me and i look forward to hearing from you and answering questions and even working together um i really wanted to do this live um, but since i'm in california um my time zones didn't work out so i have one question that was pre-submitted that i want to get into in closing um, and this question is what is, in your opinion, the greatest pitfall to avoid for museums when starting out on a new educational XR project? Well, I will say that from working in museums and working in VR, um, that we put a lot of effort into what's going to happen in the VR experience. Are, what are they going to see when they see the Mona Lisa? What is it going to look like and how is it going to sound? But we don't put a lot of effort into what happens before the experience starts, and after the experience. These are before the headset goes on and when it comes off. This is because students usually need a little bit of context to understand what they're seeing. And depending on what they're seeing, maybe it's a more um, empathetic, traumatic type of VR experience. For example, I've seen VR experiences where um, I was in a museum and they had a VR experience that showed you what the dangers of immigration were crossing the um, US-Mexican border and being hunted down. This was in a museum, really great VR exhibition, but kind of hard, kind of rough to sit through. So when you come out of that VR experience, you take off the headset, Sometimes your heart and your mind are racing and there's really nothing there to help people understand and process what they just saw. But when you go through a museum, the museum architecture is set up to help you process things. An example is I worked at the um, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. When you go through the portion of the museum about slavery and you come out of that really kind of hard traumatic experience, there is a contemplative court where you're able to have kind of waterfall around you, it's quiet, there's quotes, and that's for you just to kind of stop and breathe. That's needed. So when we're putting people into VR headsets, they need a place to when they come out to stop, to breathe and process. And not creating these spaces, I think is one of the biggest pitfalls I've seen, not only in the museum space, but in the XR community as a whole. So I would impress on everybody to think not only about the VR experience, but what your audience is seeing before and after that experience. So that is my time. I may have went over a little bit. Apologies for that. But thank you so much for hanging out with me. And if you have any other questions that I didn't get to answer, you can submit them to send them to me via email. And I look forward to talking more. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the metaverse. Bye.